transformation with a centrist message that had widespread appeal. Like the rest of the world, Greece has been struggling with the health and economic toll of COVID-19 all through this year. In the spring, the government was quick to impose a lockdown that averted the high infection and death rates that plagued so many other countries at that time. But last month, the country was forced to do the same uh, again. I wanna thank the prime minister for being with us, but I also wanna thank him for hosting a Colombia delegation that was with um, uh, him last uh, January um, as we uh, look forward to setting up a global center uh, in Athens, and um, he was terrific to us. So the prime minister is here to discuss um, everything about Greece and, and the world, and the official title for this forum is The Greek Transformation, Overcoming a Financial Crisis, Populism, and COVID. That's a very broad set of, of crises to, to deal with. So Mr. Prime Minister, it's really wonderful to see you. Can you give us uh, just an overview of uh, what is happening in Greece at this moment to start? Well, first of all, Mr. President, it's a pleasure to see you again. Um, uh, Thank you. Virtually, uh, I have very fond memories um, from your trip to Greece, and I do hope that this partnership between Columbia University uh, and uh, the Hellenic Republic uh, and Greece as a, as, as a country will go down the path uh, that we have uh, discussed with Columbia uh, University setting up uh, uh, one of its global centers uh, in, uh, in Greece. I think it will be certainly of tremendous value um, uh, to our country. Now, as far as the situation is concerned, I think you succinctly uh, summarized what um, has happened over the past nine months. Um, Greece dealt particularly well with the first uh, COVID um, uh, wave, uh, who shut down the country um, very, very early, kept infections to a very, very low numbers, kept deaths to a very, very low number. Uh, we did manage to reopen the economy during the summer. We did manage to receive some tourism uh, by adhering to very strict um, guidelines uh, um, in order to make up for at least a fraction of the lost revenue. Uh, but uh, Europe as a whole, as you know, has been hit uh, yeah. um, by a second uh, wave. Uh, no country escaped it essentially. Uh, and uh, most, Europe, most, if not all European countries essentially had to go uh, into a second uh, lockdown. The second wave has been more challenging uh, for Greece, has put more strain uh, on our um, hospital uh, system. Uh, may have to do um, uh, with, uh, with the weather, you know, other local factors certainly uh, played a role. Uh, we have seen uh, um, uh, cases uh, flattening and declining over the past uh, days, so we're cautiously uh, optimistic uh, that things will get better. But of course, as you know, uh, any lockdown takes uh, uh, a significant toll uh, on the economy. But our priority was very clear from the beginning, you know, protect the public health, protect human lives, save as many people. Uh, as, uh, as possible, support uh, our national um, uh, health system in times of crisis. It is not easy for our hospitals, our doctors, our nurses to deal with this uh, sudden surge uh, in, uh, in COVID cases because, as you know, there's always a lack between the time you actually take a decision to shut down yeah. uh, and for the curve to actually um, flatten. So um, I'm cautiously optimistic, um, uh, the vaccine... Uh, uh, vaccines actually uh, are uh, in sight. We are expecting uh, EU approval uh, of the first uh, vaccine um, uh, that has um, uh, submitted the necessary paperwork for approval. That is a Pfizer uh, bio uh, uh, vaccine, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, and we expect to start uh, vaccinating the population um, by the, you know, the latest, uh, by the beginning of January. So, uh, uh... Assuming that, um, let's say we, we have a vaccine and, and it's distributed, populations are sufficiently um, vaccinated by, let's say, late spring. And Greece came into this with economic stresses, uh, with uh, some regional uh, stresses. A lot has to, um, a lot of this has caused uh, expenditures, costs, et cetera, that um, at some point are, are going to come due. How do you see Greece and then go a little larger perhaps into Europe and we'll get to the world over the next five years? I mean, how will this, once we're beyond the actual virus, 
what are the consequences that we'll be dealing with uh, and you'll be dealing with in those okay. immediate years after? In spite of the inevitable virus gloom, I am quite optimistic about the medium to long term prospects. Yeah, interesting. The country was already doing quite well uh, before um, COVID um, hit us. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we are a center right reform oriented government that uh, came into power um, in July 2019 with a very clear mandate to reform the country. And, and, and sort of drag it into uh, mm -hmm. onto a path uh, towards uh, uh, towards uh, making sure that we are competitive in those uh, areas where we can be competitive. Uh, uh, and we have already put in place uh, significant reforms uh, to make Greece an attractive foreign direct investment uh, uh, destination, to lower the uh, the tax burden, to make the state more digital, mm -hmm. to drive through our uh, our green transformation. Uh, and um, we haven't stopped doing these reforms during COVID. Yeah. That was probably um, our most difficult challenge. How do you deal with multiple crises uh, while at the same time making yeah. sure you stick um, to your medium to long term reform agenda? Because I do expect a strong rebound, a strong recovery yeah. uh, after COVID is, is over. Maybe, you know, post war recoveries are a similar analogy. We certainly um, hope so, but we want to be ready. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when COVID is, uh, is done and dusted, that uh, Greece will be um, um, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, with those countries that come out stronger as a result of the crisis. Yeah. Uh, and there are two reasons that actually three reasons that make me uh, optimistic. The first is that uh, the international capital markets clearly buy into our story. Greece is yeah. currently borrowing with uh, record low uh, interest rates. Uh, uh, our entire yield curve uh, um, uh, um, uh, is is as low as it has uh, ever been. Uh, interest rates which were inconceivable uh, even a year ago. Yes. Obviously, uh, the European Central Bank is pumping a lot of liquidity uh, into the into the system. But I think it is also a, a vote of confidence uh, in the reform credentials of this government. Yeah. It's actually upgraded us during the crisis. They didn't mm -hmm. just keep us stable, they upgraded us. And, and there is a, a, a belief uh, that uh, Greece can come out much stronger uh, as a result of, um, uh, of this crisis. So capital markets are, are an important dimension. The domestic politics are also important. Uh, we came into power by defeating a populist government. Yeah. So we, we are uh, you know, at the forefront of what I call the post-populism uh, revolution yeah. that I think is taking place uh, in, uh, in Europe, maybe all over the, uh, the world. So uh, we've proven that when, uh, when populists come into power, they usually are totally unable to deal with the complicated uh, uh, problems that they, they inherit. I think the pendulum is swimming back. We are actually politically stronger, if you believe in the polls today, than we were when we won a resounding victory. Yes. Um, uh, 17 months ago. So the politics um, are rather favorable. And on top of that, we also have the European Union providing us with significant financial firepower. As you know, uh, and as our viewers probably know, uh, this July, the European Union took the unprecedented step of agreeing what is called the recovery and resilience package, the RRF, the recovery and resilience fund essentially borrowing at the European level, at the supranational level, 750 billion euros to distribute. Most of this is to be distributed through grants to member states. So we also have the financial firepower to support the reforms that will actually make us more competitive. Yeah. I'm uh, uh, rather uh, optimistic and uh, it is my obligation to simultaneously deal with the urgent and yeah. There's only one urgent problem, and that is dealing with COVID. But also, we shouldn't forget what is important in the medium and uh, and the long term. Uh, and uh, once we're out of this uh, crisis, and I do expect to be out of this crisis, I mean the healthcare crisis, uh, by um, uh, spring 2021, yeah. uh, I do expect a very robust recovery. We need to make up for the lost ground as quickly as possible. A, a very interesting <clears throat> Greece having gone through the period of populism and now emerged on the other side with uh, your uh, prime ministership and and uh, of course as you look at the United States 
you know, we sort of feel like we're just on the cusp of um, of that happening. Could we? Could you just share with us your views of how this so-called populism uh, movement uh, arose? A national phenomenon, but as a somewhat even perhaps global, um, and uh, you know. Fate of this um, for those who who have been concerned with the undermining of uh, democratic institutions, really at a very uh, it remains uh, a concern that half the population more or less continues to uh, endorse uh, candidates who uh, who have been responsible for that. So. Uh, this is very much on everybody's minds, on our minds, of course, here. Uh, you know all of this. Uh, just share with us how you uh, analyze this. There is a, a local, a Greek dimension, and of course, there is an international dimension to this problem. Let me start uh, with the first. Uh, the Greek populace essentially emerged out of the, you know, out of the oven uh, of a profound economic crisis. Yes. The, uh, and ten, uh, and essentially, what what happened was that the all, almost all parties, with the exception of the party <coughs> of leading, got obliterated um, uh, in the post-crisis uh, uh, political landscape that uh, emerged. There was a lot of anger, there was, there was a lot of grief, there was a lot of discontent, and and that is the you know the best fuel um, that actually drives uh, you know the populist vehicle. In our case, it actually drove it to to power. You had a yeah. small. Uh, and in our case, it was the populists from the left who teamed up with the populists from the right. It was a very interesting uh, sort of non-ideological yes. alliance. But they did share a lot of things in common, and most populists do share a lot of things in common, very simple solutions to complicated problems, you know, a profound, uh, uh, they're quite allergic to what they call uh, elites uh, and uh, scientific uh, thinking. Yeah. They, they do like to, once they are empowered, to undermine democratic institutions, and this is exactly what we saw happening in Greece. Interestingly enough, Greece proved very resilient. If there's one yeah. word to describe Greece uh, over the past uh, um, uh, 10 years, I would say it's it's resilience. Yeah. Uh, our democracy was strong enough um, uh, to put uh, a barrier to those who um, uh, undermine democratic institutions. We had a fair, uh, transparent elections. Uh, the populists were voted out of power, and, and now we are in power, and there will be another election at some point at the end of yeah. uh, a four-year tenure, and that's how democracies are supposed to work through a yeah. peaceful um, uh, transfer uh, of power. So uh, that was the uh, you know that is the you know the specific Greek context, but of course the the grievances behind uh, the populist rhetoric need to be taken extremely seriously. The populists may not have the right answers, but quite frequently they do ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. um, why do we have so much income? Um, is it that the middle class uh, has not improved its uh, living standards? Uh, what's happening with the digital divide? There are people who feel mm -hmm. uh, you know, isolated, uh, economically isolated, but also without a share uh, of real, without a real sense of identity. These are very, in my mind, very valid uh, questions. And yeah. I think it would be intellectually arrogant um, uh, to um, uh, to dispel them and discard them yeah. simply because these questions are raised by you know a group of politicians we we call uh, populists. So I take these uh, the, these questions very very seriously. And, and but I think there is uh, a uh, an approach to addressing these questions that uh, doesn't go through the gross. Uh, you know, simplification of the populist rhetoric, and this is exactly what we are trying to you know, to do in Greece. But uh, um, uh, issues such as uh, the way technology uh, affects um, uh, the job market, uh, you know, the you know the winners and losers uh, of globalization, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the short term um, uh, to tackle climate change. These mm -hmm. are all valid uh, concerns. Uh, it's just that the populists don't. Uh, most of the times, yeah. they don't have the proper answers yeah. uh, to, those, uh, to those questions. But uh, uh, we need to uh, acknowledge um, that uh, what is called, you know, the, um, the sort of uh, 
I hate stereotypes, but for the purpose of the discussion, I will use this term, you know, the elite intellectual yeah. establishment has frequently failed to address these uh, these questions uh, in, a, in, a, in a profound way and also has failed to identify itself at the psychological level with the people mm -hmm. who express uh, uh, these grievances. So I think we should certainly, we should not make, and I, I try not to make um, uh, uh, these uh, mistakes as I'm uh, as I'm running the you know the country and I trying to lead it out of the crisis. Yeah, thank you for for that. Um, so I, you know, like so many people, I feel like I spent um, many months, maybe years, uh, sort of observing uh, Greece uh, going through this incredibly difficult um, period and all the debates about the. Uh, staying in Europe, leaving uh, the Union, uh, would the um, European Union survive all of these um, uh, crises? Now, where you are at this point, what is your what are your thoughts about the uh, health and future of the European Union? Well, the European Union uh, is a unique uh, arrangement, unique in the history of the world. Yeah, uh, supranational organization with significant powers, and we have voluntarily ceded these powers to the European Union yeah. uh, in a in a very complex uh, arrangement. But we we, do, um, uh, we believe that it is in our interest to cooperate at the European level, creating you know the largest single market um, uh, in uh, in the world, uh, uh, pooling resources, demonstrating solidarity when solidarity is necessary i'm a, you know i'm a big fan of the european union in spite of its difficulties and we fully recognize that it is not easy uh, amongst 27 member states now that the uk uh, has left to always achieve a consensus quite frequently we do require unanimity in our discussions there are many sleepless nights at the level of the council until we reach an agreement but we have a way uh, to actually uh, resolve our problems and drive this common project forward and yes. what happened uh, in july was unprecedented. Uh, it took us right. five days. Um, the, we spent uh, literally two sleepless nights uh, at the council to agree uh, this 750 uh, uh, billion uh, euros package. Uh, and it wasn't easy. Um, if you just turn the clock back to March of 2020, yeah. when we first uh, raised the idea of the union being able to borrow uh, at the level of the European Commission, many people thought that was a pie in the sky that it would never have happened and it and it did happen so uh i am uh, i do believe that this was a very important it was a milestone step uh, for uh, the union uh obviously there are numerous other european projects we can spend hours discussing and you know how right. europe actually uh, adds value to uh, our member states but there are also you know issues quite frequently raised with you know european bureaucracy you know right standards uh, uh, and that, you know, finding the balance of what needs to be done at the local level and what needs to be done at the European level is not always um, easy. But uh, I, I, am, I do believe that what happened last July uh, was uh, a watershed event. For a milestone. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, we still have to, there's still, as you, as probably, you know, our students know, we still have some outstanding issues because we have two countries, Poland and Hungary, that are currently... Right. Um, uh, um, uh, objecting to how you know the next budget is going to be approved because yeah. we want some sort of connection to the question of rule of law, but I'm sure we'll be able to overcome this. It's just too much at stake uh, yeah. right now um, uh, not to be able to resolve this issue because uh, all member states, Greece included, need the money, and uh, we have already submitted uh, our draft plan for the project that we actually want to fund. Yeah. out of uh, the Recovery and Resilience Fund. It's a very, very ambitious uh, reform agenda. A significant chunk of it will be directed towards digital and green initiatives. So for the first time, we have the financial muscle, the financial firepower um, to actually support uh, the big reforms that uh, we had envisioned. We don't just need to fund them, uh, yeah. either through the, the Greek budget or through um, uh, private uh, capital. That's very interesting. So let's um, let's go to one of the uh, specific, very big issues, and we think of um, uh, Greece as on the front lines of this, and that is the migration uh, movements of people, refugees, um, uh, asylum seekers, and so on. Which, uh, of course, we all look at this with 
enormous tragedy and, and uh, enormous problems for uh, your country, for the uh, Europe, the region, and the, the world. Can you just uh, give us a, sort of a sense of where that um, issue stands, what should happen? Uh, that is, it's a very, very complex problem. Yeah. And obviously, it's almost, may almost sound as a, as a platitude, but unless you address the root causes yeah. of migration, yeah. be it war or yeah. economic desperation, you will have movement of people uh, yeah. um, from, from poorer places, for desperate people who are uh, trying to um, uh, seek safety or, uh, you know, hope for a better economic uh, freedom. I do make that distinction because between those who are entitled refugee status, those who are yep. fleeing war and persecution, whose life is in danger, uh, uh, and those who are looking for a better economic um, um, future. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is exactly the distinction we are making at the, at the policy uh, level in Greece. We have significantly accelerated uh, our asylum procedures. A lot of um, people who were entitled um, um, a protection status have received uh, that protection over the past uh, year. But we've also tightened our um, uh, our border protection because you know we, we are sort of making the obvious uh, case that uh, you know a state has a right to defend its uh, uh, its borders uh, uh, and uh, we at the end of the day need to judge um, uh, who is allowed to enter Greece and the European Union and sh who shouldn't uh, enter the European Union. So we've seen a significant reduction. Uh, over the past year, especially in the Aegean, uh, almost a 90% uh, uh, reduction. Uh, critical. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem that, uh, in the case of Greece, our nearest neighbor, Turkey, is yeah. using uh, migrants and refugees uh, as geopolitical pawns. So essentially, these people are systematically encouraged to leave Turkey. They're actually pushed into Greece, either via the land route or via the sea route, um, uh, whereas they are actually safe in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Turkey is a safe country for them. They have nothing to fear uh, in Turkey. And Turkey has actually assumed a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the European Union to control and do whatever it can um, uh, to uh, eliminate the smugglers who take advantage uh, of human uh, pain and uh, traffic people uh, across the Aegean. And I'm afraid it has done ex very, very little. Uh, if anything, it is actually systematically encouraging these people um, yeah. across. So we've taken uh, a very clear stands on this. I said, you're not going to enter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, should you, should if, if people reach um, uh, Greece, uh, they will mm -hmm. be going through the process. And if they're allowed, you know, uh, asylum, they will be granted. To fully understand uh, that the people who leave Turkey right now are in no physical danger. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them have spent years in, uh, in Turkey. They're actually systematically encouraged by Turkey um, uh, to leave. So Turkey essentially is sponsoring mm -hmm. uh, this entire smugglers uh, network uh, across uh, the Aegean, not directly, but indirectly by uh, not, you know, um, uh, allowing its coast guard to do its job, which is essentially picking people up while they're still in Turkish territorial waters and bringing them back uh, to Turkey. So, uh, before we go for um, open it up for questions, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I, I'm interested, I think we'll all be interested in sort of the your perspective on how to think about this uh, new world and and um, thinking of uh, the, the sort of the rise of China question. And Greece has been, again, a pivotal country uh, in forging a relationship with China uh, with the, the poor uh, relationship. And I just, you know, as the new administration is coming in and one of the biggest problems that uh, it faces is uh, how to set up a sophisticated, uh, highly complex and nuanced policy with respect to China. Uh, uh, questions of human rights, of course, are uh, front and center. Um, but economic relationship uh, is critically important and fraught with um, with all kinds of issues and, and problems. Um, as that is sort of reset, um, what um, how do you see uh, the uh, the proper kind of very complex, necessarily complex relationship that has to be uh, set out with with China? 
I wish I had a simple answer. At the same time, partner or competitor. So it is very, very difficult um, yeah. to, to forge a relationship, especially as a medium-sized um, European country. Yeah, we like uh, you know, we like to go with the European mainstream when it comes to the big strategic issues vis-a-vis -vis our relationship uh, uh, with uh, with China. But I think before we uh, address the the issue of China, which, as you said, is frighteningly complex, there's another relationship which is much simpler to strengthen, and that is a transatlantic bond. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and I think uh, you know I'm happy that President Elect Biden has made this one of his first priorities. I know it is one of the important uh, priorities of uh, of my colleagues, heads of state and government uh, at the. The transatlantic relationship, the relationship between the U.S. and the European Union at the geostrategic, you know, defense, economic level, is particularly strong. It was the bedrock of a yep. stable, prosperous world uh, for 70 years. So I think it is imperative that there to the best of our ability. It's probably safe to do that uh, in yes. short term. So that would be my first, my number one. Yes. And that also has dimensions vis-a-vis -vis our relationship um, uh, with uh, uh, with China. Now, yep. we as Greece, have, we have a very good um, economic relationship with uh, China. China has invested uh, in our in our biggest port. Uh, it has been a successful investment, uh, uh, you know, a win-win uh, proposition. Obviously, we're not that dependent on foreign direct investment from China. Uh, mm -hmm. China is one of the countries that is investing in uh, in Greece, but China is products. Mm -hmm. European Union recently has concluded a very important uh, Agreement regarding uh, agricultural products that have uh, you know, geographic protection and that uh, can penetrate the uh, Chinese um, uh, market. But of course, there are concerns, big concerns, yeah, um, uh, vis a vis um, uh, human rights and uh, you know the level of cooperation uh, in, in other fields. But the one thing I can say, and I think this is also critical and it, it does affect the US, is we need both China. A remote chance of meeting our ambitious uh, climate change goals. Climate. So, on, on climate, we need we, we definitely need to uh, yep. operate, and, and I'm glad to see that you know the rhetoric out of China is more positive uh, on, on that front. Of course, they're still building, building I don't know one coal uh, right. uh, station uh, a, a, a no week, um, right. but but uh, because they think long term, it's clearly in their priorities. It is absolutely important for the U.S. to rejoin you know the Paris. Uh, yeah. Board. And uh, I do think that if COVID has taught us one thing, it is that you know these global um, challenges can only be addressed through um, uh, our cooperation. And I do believe that COVID has made um, the the huge problem of tackling climate change that much more urgent. So I think yes. we expect right. more uh, more urgency rather than less uh, in addressing climate change. Um, uh, Post uh, COVID, there is a much better understanding of our common fate. Yeah, if that that is a. a have up, uh, guess what? Uh, CO two particles are also tiny. We don't see them. We don't. We right. Smell them, but uh, right. Um, they do. They, they do tons of tan uh, damage when they're emitted in uh, huge uh, quantities. So I think on climate, uh, we we definitely need the, the two big players on board because the European Union has set very ambitious targets. I hope we'll be able to agree. At the council, which is taking place in a week in Brussels, mm -hmm. um, to an even more ambitious target, reduction of 55% of greenhouse gases uh, by 2030. This is putting a strain on our economies, yep. but at the same time, it is also sending a very clear signal to the market that we have to innovate uh, yep. and placing your your chips um, um, in terms of your returns uh, in uh, in climate friendly technologies is is clearly the way to go. Yeah, it is an interesting relationship between uh, the COVID virus and uh, how it will change people's views on issues like climate change and so on. So, so fantastic um, uh, discussion. Open it up for questions, and but I would propose is that we take three questions and then you can organize the answers as okay. you as you wish. All right. So, Leonora? 
Yes, hello. My name is Lenora. I'm a freshman at Columbia College. So first of all, Kiria Mitsotaki, it's an honor to be speaking with you today. I'm currently calling in from Greece, where I managed to escape to in June after undergoing the pandemic in New York City. And the whole thing about the seller job that you did controlling is related to your role in that success. So in preventing and controlling the COVID pandemic, what leadership qualities of yours did you rely on most heavily? And what qualities did you find you had to improve most rapidly, especially in light of the harsh scrutinization from the left-wing party? Terrific. We'll go to a second. Thanks, Leonora. Hi. Hi, um, thank you very much to both of you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. My name is Tara. Um, I'm French of Syrian descent, uh, currently based in Paris um, as the CEO of a charity helping out um, homeless women. I'm a, C a CIPA alumna. I was in and very happy to be here with you today. Uh, my question is about um, migration. You, you've talked about the burden of immigration on your country. Um, and I was wondering uh, what would be, um, in your opinion, the best um, way to manage the different migration crisis existing in future um, at the EU level. Thank you. And thanks very much. Sir. And one more, please. Thank you, President Bollinger, and thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for being here with us today. I'm Charlie Huang, and I'm a first year in Columbia College. To me, it seems like finding workable solutions to structural problems requires a great deal of creativity and optimism. So I'm curious, how did you go about finding that creativity and optimism for as Minister of Administrative Reform and e-government? And how did you come to realize that such structural changes were needed instead of pursuing smaller reforms within broader structures? Well, well um, three um, uh, very uh, interesting questions. Let me start uh, with uh, the, the question posed by Lonora. Uh, we were quite successful during um, uh, the first wave, I think, because first of all, we took decisions very, uh, very early. We communicated uh, very clearly. We let the scientists do the talking rather than the, the politicians. And we, we managed to bring everybody on board because we created this sense of uh, national urgency. We also uh, used technology, I think in a rather creative um, manner, using technological tools for people to report their movements through a simple you know, SMS um, system, which I'm sure you're very um, familiar with because you still have to use it every day uh, in order to, uh, to leave your home uh, in, uh, in Greece. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we were extremely successful during the first wave. Now, we haven't been as successful during the second wave, and that raises the obvious question, why, why has this uh, happened? Uh, I think one, one explanation, it may sound simple, but I'm sure you will, you will relate to it as you, you are in Greece, is that people are just tired. Uh, and we've seen this in all European countries. People just don't stick to the rules as systematically as they did when we imposed the first um, uh, horizontal uh, lockdown. So it is more difficult now to bring the cases, um, uh, the cases down. Uh, and of course, as the, tr the crisis drags on uh, and as people don't necessarily see the light at the end of the tunnel, although now we have every reason to be more optimistic, also the, the voices, um, um, uh, you know, the conspiracy voices, the anti-vaccination voices, they sort of all become stronger, you know, say, you know, I told you so or, uh, or, uh, or, or whatever sort of message. So in my mind, uh, uh, you need to take measures quickly. Again, we did take measures even in the second lockdown quickly. You suffer economic pain, but the quicker you come out of a healthcare crisis, the quicker your economy is going to rebound. And of course, the big challenge uh, for us is how do you shut down parts of the economy while at the same time supporting those who are in greater need? And I think there we did a good job uh, because uh, we, we set aside significant amount of money uh, uh, to support essentially uh, people whom we closed their businesses, we paid we literally paid you know a significant fraction of their wages, and we also realized that especially for very small companies, access to liquidity is critical. So we essentially put in place a government-funded liquidity scheme. These people couldn't get liquidity from banks; it would take for ages. 
they didn't have the right guarantees. So we actually offered state-sponsored liquidity um, to hundreds of thousands of very small companies to keep them afloat. So, and this has been, I think, a rather successful uh, measure. And you know, hopefully, we'll we're past the peak of the second um, uh, wave, uh, and uh, we will, you know, start uh, relaxing the measures, uh, you know, within the next uh, week weeks. That at least is. Uh... At the same time, going through this crisis, you also realize that you need to strengthen your healthcare system on the go. So you need to make repairs. Literally, you don't have time to, to restructure your whole healthcare system, but you have to make repairs on the go. So we we doubled our intensive uh, care um, units, uh, beds, during the crisis. We started with a very, very low number. Uh, we, we doubled it. We hired uh, more people through uh, express procedures. It's complicated, while at the same time, you know, you have a hospital operating at peak capacity, and at the same time, you're actually doing building work to add more ICU beds. It's really, really complicated. But by the end of the crisis, we will also have a better healthcare system and a greater belief uh, in, uh, uh, in how, um, uh, you know, healthcare provided healthcare for all is an important pillar for social solidarity. It is um, um, uh, uh, COVID is, a, is, a, is an equalizer. You know, it, it treats everyone the same. Hospitals, everyone went to public hospitals. Uh, so no matter whether you're rich or poor, you had access to a public hospital, had the same treatment. Uh, and uh, there is a much better, uh, and every single Greek had access to a, to a hospital bed, even at a time when our system was under a lot of pressure. So I think there's a, there's a great value uh, in supporting these publicly funded national healthcare system, make, but at the same time, make them more innovative, uh, make them work better with the private sector. But this, I think, is an, is an important gain from, uh, from the crisis. Now, let me take Charles's question first on creativity uh, and, uh, and optimism. Indeed, you have to be, well, being optimistic, I'm an optimist by nature. I can tell you there are days which are quite gloomy. Um, uh, and uh, it is emotionally taxing. For example, yesterday, we were on a, on a nice you know, downward trend. Suddenly, we saw a blip. You know, it's, 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 it's worrisome, but you have to, you have to be uh, optimistic. You have to believe in your abilities and the abilities of your team. But at the same time, you also have to be adaptable. You know, if you, if you realize you've made, you've made a mistake, you know, recognize it and change course um, quickly and do, so, uh, and do so publicly. Because I can tell you, no one has a blueprint for this. We had to deal simultaneously with a COVID crisis, a refugee crisis, and a very aggressive neighbor um, uh, in Turkey. And no one prepared us. Uh, for this. So literally you have to uh, learn uh, on the go and you have to be creative and sometimes you have to set, you know, very bold uh, goals. Uh, for example, uh, we have every single uh, classroom in Greece now in digital format. Every single classroom from the age of four to the age of 18. You know, all schools are closed, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, all classrooms are taking place digitally. If you asked you know, a year ago whether the Greek state would ever be able to organize this, they would, they would have told you impossible. If you asked that teachers would be able to adapt, the people would have told you, no, 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 they won't be able to do it. But they did it. And if you asked whether kids, you know, six-year or seven-year-old kids would be able to go through this process, you know, a lot of people would tell you, no, this can't happen. Well, guess what? It did, it did happen. Of course, as you know, there is no substitute for a proper classroom. And I do understand also um, uh, the, the frustration sometimes, you know, you want to be on campus, you can't be on campus. My daughter is a senior at high school. You know, she constantly moans about not having the proper senior experience. But, you know, it's a war and we have to uh, adjust. So you have to be, you know, you're forced to be creative. You're forced to look for, you know, talk to our colleagues, you know, pick up, you know, uh, solutions, uh, practical solutions on the go. But at the same time, make sure you focus on the long-term changes. Uh, I don't remember which president, I think it was uh, Eisenhower, who said, never let the urgent crowd out the important. Um, of course, the urgent is urgent, and we need to address it. But what is important at the same time is to make sure that we lay the foundations uh, for what is essentially a transformation of the country, uh, be it when it comes to the state. We're offering so many more services digitally. And in that sense, COVID was an incredible accelerator. Um, we, we moved, you know, a significant number of services um, uh, in, onto our um, site, you know, gov.gr, uh, uh, within a matter of weeks. 
So when you're faced with you know, the necessity, you find creative ways of addressing uh, the problems. Now to Tara's question on migration, I think a very relevant question. Migration is a European problem, and I'm very glad you pointed it out. Uh, we happen to be on the external borders, but it is extremely unjust for Greece to suffer you know, the pain of dealing with this problem on our own. So what we're trying to do uh, is we're trying to come up with a European uh, refugee and migration pact. And one of, the, I think, uh, of the critical um, dimensions of this arrangement has to be the fact that we need to have obscure. So whether you file for asylum in Greece or in Denmark, your application needs to be treated in the same way so that people don't shop for, um, uh, you know, for a favorable sort of asylum uh, uh, destinations uh, and take advantage uh, of the differences in, in the system. We need a common approach towards uh, our frontiers, our, our borders. So we need to strengthen Frontex, which is the, the European border management um, force. Um, we need a common policy and returns. What is it we do with people whose application is declined? Uh, and we need more solidarity. And ideally, we should also have more solidarity in terms of allocating people who actually are granted asylum with the Syrian um, 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 people who have applied for asylum and have received asylum uh, in Greece. And we're very happy to integrate them. And we can do that. Um, uh, and we will always be open um, to those who flee war and pursue. Once the Syrian crisis is over to return to Syria, some of them may actually want to stay in Greece and they will be welcome here um, uh, to, to build a future uh, for them and their family. But no European country can deal with this problem on its own. And sometimes it is incredibly selfish when we see European countries uh, argue that this is not their problem simply because they are not on the border. Uh, so erecting an internal fence and basically telling you know, countries such as there is no solidarity from us. So that is a selfish behavior that uh, needs to be addressed at the European uh, level. We can't just uh, address a problem around. Thank you for those answers. Um, uh, let's take three more. Um, hello, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Um, so my question had to do with um, ancient Greek uh, culture. So obviously, as we know, ancient Greece was one of the cradles of scientific thought, cultural thought, spiritual thought, and many other ways. But sadly, many of the artifacts that were produced were um, unintentionally or intentionally taken away from Greece. So do you believe that Greece has the right to recover some of these artifacts that are now found in private collections or museums um, all around the world? So this is the Elgin marbles problem. Right? Um, hello, Mr. Prime Minister from the Glyphada area of Greece. I'm a rising senior at Columbia College, currently taking a gap year in Athens. Uh, my question is a COVID question. Um, it's um, how viable do you think is shutting down horizontally um, economic activity uh, in light of uh, the rise of ICU cases? especially given that a vaccine is not to be widely administered till uh, later in 2021, if it is indeed released uh, soon. And uh, do you think that the Greek economy can sustain one or possibly two more lockdowns and to what consequence? Thank you, Mariana. And lastly. Yes. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. I'm Vasilis Fethanakis, a native of Greece from Hania. Uh, I came uh, for graduate studies at Columbia. Now I direct the Center for Life Cycle Analysis there. And our work is uh, at uh, topics at the interface of energy, environment, and uh, and We're from you that uh, among your basic reforms is actually the green, the green transformation. Could you please tell us a little more about that, about uh, what is your planning for transforming the energy infrastructure of Greece? And uh, if there is a timeline along, obviously, the European, actually, timelines and best efforts there. Great. Thank you very much for the questions. Well, to the first um, uh, question, reclaiming stolen artifacts is a constant um, priority for the country, for our Ministry of Culture, and we do recover 
um, uh, periodically we do manage to recover uh, artifacts uh, uh, that belong to, to Greece and to Greek museums, but of course there's a jewel in the crown. Uh, and that is the um, what we call the Parthenon marbles. They shouldn't be called the Elgin marbles. They should be called the Parthenon marbles. The, these are the, you know, the uh, half of the of the Parthenon frieze essentially, um, uh, and uh, uh, the the treasure that finds itself uh, today in the British Museum stolen by Lord Elgin uh, uh, during the beginning of the 19th century. I think there's more momentum today than there has ever been. To actually um, uh, return those to Greece, uh, we build a new Acropolis museum that is stunning. So there is no case to be made that we don't have a proper museum to house them. This really is uh, is an argument about the unity of the monument, and this is not just any monument. It is probably the symbol of classical Greece. Uh, I think one of the most important um, uh, monuments uh, ever constructed uh, uh, by mankind. Uh, and uh, I think there is a grassroots movement stronger than uh, than ever to push the uh, the UK government to actually change a, uh, a law that would allow the British Museum, whose trustees are appointed by the government, to contemplate returning the marbles to Greece. So this is a personal project for me. It's going to take time. Uh, I'm glad to see that um, young students such as um, uh, yourself, uh, and we have a very, very credible, both a legal case, but also a moral case, uh, why the Parthenon um, uh, marbles need to be uh, returned to Greece, and it would be, of course, a, a gesture of uh, symbolic importance. Of course, not all artifacts in, uh, in what we call the global um, international museums will be returned to their countries of origin, but I think the Parthenon marbles are a special case, A, because they were clearly stolen, uh, and, and, and B, because they have to do with the unity uh, of uh, the monument. So I think they're clearly uh, in a category of, uh, of their own. To Mariana's question, shutting down the economy is painful. Uh, and uh, you need to provide uh, literally support month by month. We have the funds to do it, uh, at least until the... Uh, but of course, to do so, we need European funds. And all countries have raised their level of borrowing to deal with COVID. So our debt is going up. And that, of course, is a concern for a country that has a high level of debt. The capital markets are not concerned for two reasons, because I think they have trust in the government and because they know that the central bank will continue to pump liquidity uh, for as long as it is uh, uh, necessary. Uh, but uh, frankly, there, there is no trade-off. And I think we all reach the same painful solution, uh, conclusion. I hope that the U.S. will not follow down that path over the next month. And my conclusion, and I think the conclusion of all European leaders, is that at least during the winter, you cannot contain COVID through half measures. You just can't. Um, uh, we all tried half measures, you know, in September, October, and we were all faced with the same surge in, uh, in cases. So um, unless we can manage people to convince them to always wear a mask, which is difficult for all of us, and there will always be, you know, some, uh, some sort of leakage, you know, keeping their distance, um, um, you will have these sort of surges. And in the case of Greece, I hope that we've learned our lesson because we did incredibly well during the first phase. I think we became slightly complacent during the summer. And now we saw the impact of complacency. So at least I do hope, Mariana, that as we move out of the second lockdown, we will be that much more careful. But again, we need to be aware of the fact that certain types of economic activity are simply not going um, uh, to, uh, to operate until we have a vaccine. For example, nighttime entertainment, bars, um, after hours entertainment. We can't have people crowded in bars until we have a vaccine. Maybe at some point we'll be able to open restaurants with, with proper social distancing. You can certainly contemplate opening retail, uh, but um, uh, certain restrictions will be absolutely necessary uh, until we find the vaccine. Uh, the good thing is, as I told you, that we have the money, we have the liquidity um, to support the economy during these uh, very, very painful um, um, uh, times. Now, uh, to Vasily's question um, uh, from Khanya, uh, Crete, uh, as President Bolger may know, I'm actually also from Khanya, so uh, uh, there is a, a, you know, a Cretan affinity uh, here. We have a very ambitious energy transformation um, uh, project. I, I announced uh, last year at the United Nations General Assembly that Greece will be closing down all our lignite. Lignite is brown coal. Um, our lignite-fired uh, energy plants by 2023, except for one, 
and that last one will be closed the latest by 2028. So I aggressively send a signal to the market that we're moving away from coal. So we'll be moving into natural gas as a transition fuel, and of course, actively moving into renewables where we already have a tremendous interest. We have much more interest by investors than we can possibly accommodate in terms of the production licenses uh, that, we can, uh, that we can give um, out. At the same time, uh, it's about you know, uh, using European funds for uh, important, very important uh, projects that will decrease our energy footprint. Probably the most emblematic, the biggest one, uh, is a huge pro uh, program to retrofit our buildings. Um, as you know, buildings, um, uh, poor insulation is causing significant uh, you know, CO2. Um, uh, buildings more energy efficient is a win-win because it reduces your CO2 footprint. It gives jobs to lots of people because it's, it's very labor intensive. It supports your local uh, building materials industry. So this is one example of the programs, the aggressive programs that we're putting in place. Another example was, uh, uh, you know, how quickly we want to move in electrification. And we have examples where Greece could be a world leader, our islands. You know, I have very ambitious plans to make our islands carbon neutral as early as possible. Uh, a month ago, I signed with the CEO of Volkswagen, a very ambitious project um, to turn one of our medium-sized islands, not very well known, an island called Astipalea, uh, into a green island with all electric mobility um, within the next five years. So um, uh, it's also a test case of whether we can island, a medium-sized island, uh, into, into, into a fully uh, uh, electric mobility island uh, fueled exclusively uh, through sustainable energy um, uh, relatively soon. Uh, and this is uh, taking uh, place. Uh, so for us as a country with ample wind uh, and sun, renewables is, is clearly the, uh, the way to go. But we had to take a painful decision to shut down uh, all our lignite plants, and, but at the same time put in place a, a viable transition plan for those regions that are heavily dependent on coal. Uh, it's painful, but these are labor-intensive regions. You need to offer these people an alternative future. So we have a special plan. All our coal is essentially produced in one area, in Western Macedonia. So we have a special growth plan for that area with to, tell, to actually explain to people that they can envision a better future and a better future for their kids rather than you know, digging up coal in, in coal mines. I know this is an issue for also it's an issue for the, for the U.S., for, um, for many countries, but you know, we have to stare um, you know, into, into the future, look at, um, you know, look, at, you know, look at the data, look at what the science is, uh, is telling us. We've got to move away from coal as, as quickly as possible. I think we have time uh, for one more question. Firstly, thank you so much for speaking to us today. It is truly an honor. My name is Ioana Zervagi. I'm currently in Athens, Greece, and I'm a freshman at Columbia College. So you mentioned that people belonging to an elite educational tier often cannot understand or appeal to the Greek public. Hence, how can Greek students studying at Columbia use their education to benefit Greeks? Well, first of all, by, uh, I think by, it's a discussion I frequently have with my kids because I do tell them that they are lucky enough to, uh, to study in, in, in top American universities. So the question then is, what is it that you actually give back to society and how can you use your education to actually make a difference? Uh, I think the first thing is to, to recognize that there is a moral obligation um, to give back to your community, your country, your community, whatever you choose to, to do, either to do it you know, part-time or to choose to do it full-time, that there is a duty um, a, a moral duty towards public um, uh, service that we cannot just afford to ignore. This is not just about getting a degree um, uh, to just make, make more money uh, in, in a high paying job. There are other things uh, you know, that actually give, can give you great um, uh, satisfaction. So the first is the realization of the moral and ethical dilemmas that I think any conscious young person needs to uh, address in terms of what it is they want to do with their life, what gives them real pleasure. And then I think that uh, uh, for me, the real challenge is how do you use the intellectual tools, the brain power that you have, what you've learned at the top uh, terrific schools such as Columbia to actually make people's lives better. Uh, because as, as you said, uh, there, uh, and as we discussed, there are no simple answers. So you need to think hard uh, about how to address these problems. And, you know, Columbia uh, gives you exactly these uh, tools, you know, first of all, asking the right questions, 
uh, and then hopefully coming up with uh, uh, with answers based on uh, on logic, uh, on on scientific um, uh, research, uh, and then of course, you know, I always make that pledge uh, uh, dearly when I speak to students: is you need to consider seriously at some point whether you're interested in public service, uh, because if the best and the brightest have no interest in public service, then who's going to be left to do the job? Uh, and then we're all going to be complaining. We don't like, we don't trust our politicians, but how, what have we done to actually change that? Uh, in maybe in, in the previous generation, it was an honor to be in public service. The best and brightest did go into public service. And even if they didn't do it for a career, they did it for, for a period. So they saw it as a project in their life, you know, take some time off, you know, stop earning money, you know, go help the government. Is this really happening now? Uh, I'm afraid less so. Happening. One of them being the totally sort of vitriolic uh, nature of the political discourse, which simply drives people away. Not everyone has a stomach to deal with uh, the level of abuse uh, that someone who um, who's uh, exposed uh, has to has to suffer. So these, I think, are interesting questions um, uh, and maybe some food for thought uh, as we come to the end of this discussion, uh, Mr. President. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy that these questions are being asked by your uh, by your students, uh, because uh, you know we all start our education with a with a dream to change the world, maybe change our country or change our community, uh, and somehow, sometimes, uh, it's a, of course, the privilege of uh, uh, being part of a university to have these wonderful young people. You, you've been fantastic, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Really, uh, uh, just a great. Um, a discussion great to hear you we really appreciate your taking this time i have the feeling that um most of my students are in your country at this point based upon where well, you know we have a strong uh you know colombia is is well represented uh, right. <laughs> Greeks are, are well represented uh at, yes at colombia, but you know i'm happy to all the greek students who are uh, attending that they can you know, at least, uh, you know, yes. uh, and their classes online. And I do, you know, my hope is that, you know, next semester they will all be back. And we look forward to more conversations with you and uh, more presence of Colombia in Greece and vice versa. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye.